Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased today to be with an old friend and former student, Steve Vinsky. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction to Steve. Uh, he's sitting in his home in Narragansett, Rhode Island right now while I'm in Chicago. Steve has a JD and an LLM, both law degrees in international and comparative law, as well as an MBA from Booth in the XP75 cohort. In addition, he was in the US Marine Corps, including serving in the Office of Secretary of Defense. And I like to joke with him, there's a famous phrase with Marines, once a Marine, always a Marine. And I always tell him that since he's an alumnus, once a Maroon, always a Maroon as well. Although I, we can't really compete with being a Marine. Um, Steve served uh, in a variety of different roles in his amazing career. He was counsel to the US Congressional Government Operations Committee. Um, he spent 20, I believe at one point he worked at the, yeah, the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon. He spent more than 20 years in various VP and SVP roles as chief compliance officer, um, either insourced or outsourced in life science and healthcare companies, including Japanese and European companies. He's been involved in several high profile cases, including TAP Pharmaceuticals, which resulted in a settlement of $885 million. Um, Steve is the founder of Trestle Compliance, uh, which he currently runs. It is perhaps the world's leading consulting firm on corporate compliance issues. In the interest of disclosure, I'll mention that I am on Steve's advisory board for Trestle Compliance. So we work together a little bit. And then last but not least, Steve is a COVID-19 survivor. He was in the ICU for several days earlier this year. And it means that much more than that you're with us here today. And I hope you're, you're do, staying healthy, Steve. Well, Mike, uh, thank you so much. It's a real honor and privilege um, to be here today um, with your students. And being a fellow student, I'm a very proud fellow student and alum uh, and a proud Maroon and a proud Marine. So uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, it's always uh, fascinating to discuss uh, all kinds of issues with you um, and very stimulating in the real Chicago tradition. So I look forward to doing that here with you on this topic of governance and, and compliance. All right. Um, if you could just help us understand what is compliance? It's, it's a, yeah. a, well, a somewhat broad term, but also a somewhat specific term, right? It is, it is a, and frankly, let, let me just start saying there's an unfortunate term because I know for me, when I sit on a plane, which I don't do at all anymore, and I hope to resume that, when I hear, you know, you have to be in compliance with, uh, as with most people, my body stiffens and I'm sort of bracing for, okay, what's coming? Uh, and it's uh, an unfortunate uh, term that's been picked up. Uh, but basically compliance is, uh, the compliance programs are, uh, uh, it's a centralized process to ensure a behavior within a corporation that is compliant with laws and regulations and internal policies. And it's really to ensure that employees, colleagues, uh, everyone from the top down uh, behave in a certain way to achieve a common, common set of goals. Uh, and that's pure and simple what it should be. What it shouldn't be and what people fear that it is, is a set of corporate cops looking over their shoulder, putting targets on people's backs and perhaps you know, handcuffing them figuratively and preventing them from succeeding. A good compliance program and a good compliance officer is really a, an ally, a colleague that helps set out clear boundaries. And when it's gray, uh, sets out a process to coordinate and collaborate to come up with good business solutions to, to compete and win aggressively in the marketplace. Oh, that, that's, that's very interesting. Is, is compliance separate from auditing? Is it, well, is it tied to it or are they parallel efforts? Well, uh, auditing, there are different kinds of auditing. There's financial auditing and increasingly there's compliance auditing. Yeah, was... Compliance programs as outlined by various governmental guidances, um, uh, auditing is a key component. It's one of the so-called uh, seven essential elements of a compliance program. So uh, monitoring, which is checking uh, in present time, keeping your pulse on the corporate activities is an essential element. Auditing is more backward looking at, at past activities and verifying that they were performed appropriately. So auditing is a key component of compliance, but it's a subset and it's a compliance auditing versus financial auditing. 
Okay. Yeah, I asked that question. Um, I like that distinction, backward looking and forward looking. I think that's very helpful um, for framing. Um, so I asked it, um, not really realizing that idea that you'd suggested, that you'd implied, but now you've crystallized it. Um, but also um, in a corporate governance setting, it is natural to always talk about the audit committee and financial auditing and so forth. And so it's, it's really nice to broaden it, to think about other kinds of risk management or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, exactly. Um, one of the things that for, for people that don't live and breathe this stuff as I have for 25 years, which, and I'm still smiling, believe it or not, so, um, uh, is, is uh, distinguishing, as you've suggested, between uh, these different kinds of um, activities, whether it be compliance or risk management or social corporate responsibility, governance, uh, monitoring, auditing, how does all this fit together? And after a while, it seems overwhelming and cumbersome and costly. And certainly if you're a CEO, an executive or board member, um, you, you tend to really sort of bite your lip. It's, uh, and, and with all respect to everyone in the insurance industry, I don't know about you, but I sort of bite my lip when I have to write the check for the insurance bill. It's, it's, uh, and it's not something you really want to pay for because you feel like, is it really necessary? Where we hire good people with integrity, with character, we do all the diff different diligence, then why do we need all of this framework to govern what we do? Uh, and that's a very legitimate question uh, that, that comes into play here uh, when you're talking about governance, et cetera. And, and you know, being a student of history and, and now increasingly of, of psychology and of people, uh, one of the challenges with compliance and the way to make it successful is to really be able to explain the why behind the what, uh, to make sure that uh, you connect with people's hearts and minds and and uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of books uh, being written now about um, how ideas stick or don't stick, how you bring about change, et cetera. So uh, I've made a career essentially of, of really trying to integrate these kinds of concepts and, and learnings into ensuring that compliance is a value adding uh, process that enables uh, competition. So I've focused on commercial compliance. There, that's a, sort of the first question you ask, and the first question I asked when I first became a compliance officer back in the 90s is, compliance with what? My God, where do you start, right? There, uh, there's HR compliance, there's financial compliance, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, that's certainly part of, you know, climbing the Everest of compliance is figuring out where do you start to get to the top. Okay, so help us with that. Where do you start? <laughs> well, um, it, it all comes down to risk, is risk prioritizing. And, and actually back in the 90s, uh, that was almost anathema to, to general counsels and attorneys because from their point of view back at that time in the early 2000s even, if you suggested that we sort of risk rank compliance uh, activities, that, that almost inherently suggests you're willing to accept something less than 100% compli compliance. So there's no such thing as zero tolerance, which again, opens up liability from a legal perspective. Fortunately, the government and others now have totally done a 180 on that. And now they say you absolutely should risk prioritize it. And at the end of the day, uh, it only makes sense. You have limited resources, limited time. And so you have to identify what your top risks are and address them in a, in a prioritized way. And so as of last April, 2019, uh, the Department of Justice, in fact, came out with new compliance guidance for what makes for an effective compliance program. And they put doing a risk assessment as number one, uh, the most important first step, so that you, you can show that you've done your diligence, you've understood what your key risks are and addressing them appropriately. Uh, I have focused in my industry that I've been living in is the life sciences industry, which is certainly uh, in the news these days, uh, and rightly so. Uh, it, and some, some of the largest settlements uh, in the US of uh, corporate history have occurred in the life sciences, and for good reason. It involves life and death, patients, health, and lots of money uh, from the federal government. It's most uh, pharmaceutical products and other healthcare products are reimbursed some type of federal program. 
So when you combine those two things, it, it, it requires an appropriate oversight to make sure the uh, taxpayer monies are appropriately spent and that people are kept safe um, from medication. So uh, sales and marketing activities in the life sciences have historically been the number one risk area for life science companies. Similarly, with other industries such as defense contracting, uh, oil and gas, um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and, and anti-corruption have been top issues. Uh, and you see um, governments throughout the world uh, cracking down on corruption. Uh, so, so that's been a development now for at least 12 years um, in terms of a you know, real big uh, focus area. Wow, this is a huge area, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and only growing. Um, it it is sounding bureaucratic. Tell me why I should be taking this seriously. Well, you know, and that's something that I've learned um, from salespeople. A good salespeople are, are are first of all undervalued by other colleagues, uh, but good salespeople have a tremendous mix of talent. First of all. Uh, being a, a likable, charismatic people that when they walk into a room, um, you know, they instantly connect with other people. They tend to have incredible positive energy. Uh, and at the same time, again, the best salespeople are very analytical. They know their market, they know their customers, they know, um, they know the science behind the product, if it's a pharmaceutical product, et cetera. They know the analytics. Uh, and, and well, they should because they're driven by numbers. They have very aggressive numbers. They also tend to be extremely well organized because they're pretty much on their own out in the field uh, and they need to time manage and prioritize. And when you w walk in the shoes of a salesperson, you realize just what a limited amount of time they have. They also have to have incredibly thick skin. <laughs> when when you have rejection after rejection, as you first do, as, as with any kind of opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, appreciating that world uh, and then having the layers of different rules and regulations and all the things that may sound like you can't do this, you can't do that, uh, you can understand why there's a frustration and, and perhaps a temptation for salespeople to maybe cross the line um, and do something that's inappropriate. Um, the other thing that uh, is a bit more abstract, but I think is very relevant, particularly in the United States, uh, is our culture, our culture of independence. And we're seeing it now uh, uh, increasingly where, um, you know, with the whole issue of mask wearing in the whole COVID-19 uh, era, people are resisting being told what to do. Um, but we're a country that was founded on a revolution, <laughs> on, on, on throwing, you know, tea into the Boston Harbor and, and we have prided ourselves of, on taming the Wild West and, and being innovative. So the word compliance and sort of doing what you're told is, is really very countercultural and not who we are as Americans. So how do you turn that around? Um, well, again, it's, first of all, uh, explaining to folks what's in it for you. Why should you do this? Uh, explaining the why behind the what. Um, and sometimes there's nothing better than a, than a clear example. Um, you know, whether we're adults as students and graduate programs um, or as children growing up at, at different levels of, of, of our, our schooling, it's uh, stories that often help us understand, that bring to life the concepts. And you as a professor, as a teacher, know better than anybody else <laughs> that to engage students, you have to make it real. Um, and so when it comes to compliance, uh, sometimes uh, there are plenty of, um, uh, in a negative way, uh, corporate carcasses <laughs> that, that have, that have uh, strewn uh, the history of, of, of compliance enforcement. There's no shortage of examples of, of big mega fines in the billions of dollars now of uh, corporate executives, CEOs, uh, senior VPs, etc., cetera, of uh, being prosecuted at a tremendous personal cost. Uh, and and emotional cost and, and jailed. Um, so, you know, that's certainly something to keep in mind, but, but I like to focus more on the positive. Uh, despite studies that suggest that the people are more responsive to negative reinforcement, I still think that um, going into this, if you present 
a positive uh, approach where you lead with values, the, the values of an organization and, and we're the leader at the top. So if you have any uh, CEOs or aspiring CEOs in, in your class, uh, I would say the number one thing that drives effective compliance and governance is the tone that that leader sets uh, from the outset, that we're a company of integrity, we're a company of character. We are driven in, in the healthcare industry by patients and the welfare of patients. That we're also a company, a responsible company to our shareholders, if you're a public company, <coughs> excuse me, and we're responsible for the funds that we spend and we spend them appropriately. And all good citizens, as whether we're individual or corporate citizens, we abide by the law. Um, and here's why, because uh, history shows us that companies that succeed, succeed best when their reputations precede them, when they're known as, as the companies of, of character and integrity that you can trust. Um, a fellow advisory board on our firm that you know well now, Dr. David Shore from, from Harvard, uh, has written extensively on trust. And um, one of the examples he cites that in the poorest ghetto in Soweto in South Africa, where people um, literally live day to day, when given the choice between a more expensive branded detergent or, or a generic that they had never seen before, they'll pay the scarce extra money to get the branded detergent. Why? Because they trust it, because they can't afford to have the non-detergent not work and have it be wasted. And so similarly with compliance, if you see it as a brand enhancer, if you see it as really enabling you to collaborate as a team, that it's all driven by principles, by values that you believe in, that you're proud to be a part of it as an individual and also as an extension of your family. Uh, then that can really help energize and motivate people to say, you know, I work for a great company. You know, there are lots of examples of where well, I work for IBM, Big Blue. I work for Apple, you know, a, a tremendous innovator. Uh, I work for Amazon or Google or whatever company that you think is a great company. Um, generally speaking, people think of a company that's great because it's led well, it's performed well, and it delivers great value to society. Um, and so compliance, <coughs> excuse me, um, should really be an enhancer in that regard and should be uh, led in that way. But, but at the end of the day, it really does come down to each individual. Each individual is responsible for their own compliance, but you need a leader to help frame it, articulate it, uh, and make it relevant to that person. Oh, thank you. That was really interesting. As with almost everything in, in organizations, leadership is is the start or the end of everything. And from that flows the culture and, and therefore um, many parts of behavior and the limits on it and, um, and the intrinsic motivation as well, the type of people you recruit. So it was interesting you tied that in to all of that. Could you briefly walk me through, imagine that I am a CEO of a company and I engage Trestle Compliance. How do you work with me to set up a compliance program? Sure, I'd be happy to, Mike. Um, well, first and foremost, um, I want to ensure I understand your business and, and you and your goals. Uh, and I wanna understand where you are now and where you'd like to be moving ahead. So one of the things I'd, I would recommend is, you know, much like if you're talking to a fitness coach and you say, you know what, I, I, want, to help, I want you to help me get in shape. It's the first thing you do is sort of do an initial assessment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, like, well, what, what, what's your current condition uh, from a compliance perspective for the CEO? Let's see where you are uh, and then let's um, read that out and, and then make an implementation plan going forward. Again, risk prioritizing, trying to identify uh, what's in place that's working well. Again, one of the mistakes I have seen uh, other colleagues of mine make, which is the, often the fear, and rightly so, of many CEOs, is that, all right, all these guys are going to do is come in and try to look for something that isn't working, that's bad, and just uh, burden me with the, with the real negative report that, you know, um, I know we don't have things in place, but I, I don't really want that kind of report. So we wouldn't do that. What we would do is, is do a very objective snapshot that takes into account what we can leverage that the company already has, and then at the same time, see what gaps need to be filled, and then develop an implementation program along those seven elements that I mentioned, 
and, and one of the mistakes many companies make is to be very reactive and just say, oh, okay, uh, this other company, competitor of ours got in trouble um, for these privacy violations or for this anti-corruption issue. And they um, j just uh, attack it issue by issue rather than in a comprehensive way. Uh, the, the reason that that generally doesn't work at uh, any uh, military folks or Marines or, or marksmen out there would uh, recognize this term. It's called um, chasing the bullseye, uh, where you're not hitting the target, you're just chasing it around. And the reason is you're not focused uh, properly on, on how to uh, hit that bullseye. But here, uh, if you're focused on the broader picture of, a, of a putting in place uh, an appropriately scaled and appropriately risk prioritized compliance program, that has uh, a code of conduct, uh, appropriate relevant policies and procedures, training, communications, monitoring, auditing, discipline, and preventative actions, and, and a reporting mechanism, then um, you're not gonna, it's not gonna work. So the, the key thing is, is I would speak to the CEO and say, okay, um, what do you do as a business? Uh, this is what I understand. What are your concerns? Uh, here's what I recommend we do, and then de deliver that report, uh, and then take it from there. And we've had great success in that approach. Just as a quick kind of side question. So um, compliance in, uh, it sounds like you would be working with, probably with uh, HR for sure, maybe manufacturing, sales force, but different parts of the organization do companies typically have separate compliance departments or how do they structure this kind of process or do we just outsource this to you? Well, uh, you can do either one. Uh, it depends on where the company is in its development. Uh, we've worked with some of the largest uh, global companies where they have uh, quite advanced compliance departments that are standalone departments where the compliance officer is a C-suite executive and reports into the CEO or president. Uh, sometimes, uh, increasingly, we're seeing compliance officers reporting into the general counsel's office, but again, uh, a senior executive. For smaller companies that may be preparing to launch their first product, uh, they likely do not have uh, any kind of compliance uh, officer or staff in place, <coughs> may not even have a general counsel, although most would, but those general counsels do often have um, more of a corporate patent uh, background versus a commercial compliance background. So uh, in any event, um, we have outsourced to compliance officer roles uh, to the smaller companies. Uh, there's um, a lot of value in that. A, you save a lot of time and recruiting costs and you, you get a level of experience that would cost uh, probably two, three, four times what you would pay for a full-time employee of equivalent um, experience. Uh, second, um, it's, it, it gets you to the right place much quicker um, where uh, you don't need to invest in, in building out an FTE uh, department, but can really uh, get everything in place very quickly through, through an outsourced uh, process. Uh, it's a much more nimble, much, much quicker. You can turn it on and off uh, when and if uh, is appropriate. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a very attractive model uh, uh, that several smaller companies have taken advantage of. Okay. So let's get back to um, corporate governance. Um, is compliance an appropriate role for the board of directors? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, there's, a, there's a key legal precedent from uh, the 1990s, late 1990s called In Re Caremark. Uh, and that involved, as the name suggests, the Caremark Corporation, where the Delaware Chancery Court found uh, liability for individual directors and the board of Caremark for not exercising proper board oversight of their compliance program. And that uh, has tremendous uh, precedential value because of course many corporations to include mine uh, is incorporated in Delaware. Um, and, and also it really set the precedent that suggested uh, boards can no longer be hands off. Uh, boards can no longer just sort of accept a, a board role, be paid a certain amount per year and be passive. They have to be actively engaged um, and they have to actively oversee a corporate compliance program, A, to be considered uh, in compliance with their board 
fiduciary responsibilities, but then also for the company to be able to claim they have an effective compliance program. And so over that course of time, um, there have been additional guidances issued from the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services, for example, in terms of a, an appropriate board role. Um, and there are lots of resources that you know, coach uh, organizations on, on what that is. Uh, uh, increasingly, uh, it's within a board. That role is delegated to an audit committee of the board where you have independent directors, again, to make it that much more credible that there's active independent oversight uh, to ensure that the company is adhering to its compliance policies and standards. Um, so uh, in terms of governance, uh, compliance increasingly is becoming recognized as a part of that. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll get to the, you know, the distinction where historically governance uh, in the US Anglo models have focused on shareholder uh, governance and shareholder interests. <clears throat> and, and increasingly, um, compliance, as I spoke earlier about uh, governance generally as being a, a system of managing human behavior within certain boundaries, um, from a, uh, an operational perspective, compliance programs should be an extension uh, of that board oversight role that sets the values and tone and direction of the company um, from a responsible management perspective, and then filters that down to specific uh, policies, procedures, training, et cetera. And again, not to handcuff employees and restrict them, but rather to embolden them so that they know what, where the boundaries are so they can be aggressive in, in, yeah. in getting up to those boundaries. That's yeah, the when, we, when we talked a couple of weeks ago about doing this session, um, you said some things that were really interesting. You, you talked to me about how compliance contrasts with and complements governance. And I'm, I think this is where you're going right now. I thought that was an interesting observation. So as you describe compliance to me, it, it's a board role. It's probably the audit committee unless they have a separate compliance committee or something like that. Right. Um, so it is a, a traditional risk management function um, and fiduciary um, duty role of the board, but you also talked about it as a way to, for the CEO to set the tone, the values, and the corporate culture. And in my mind, that goes beyond what we typically see as discussions about audit. Yes. Quite a bit. So could you speak a little bit about that complementing and contrasting and contributing with governance? My, my pleasure. So on the one hand, uh, compliance complements uh, the concept of, of corporate governance in that when you step back about it and you go um, back to the derivation of, of the term governance, it, it's really about establishing order, um, predictable uh, order within the organization. And so the, the governance at the board level is ensuring that financially uh, the company is being appropriately managed, responsibly managed, fiscally uh, responsibly managed, et cetera. Um, but when you really dive into it, well, day to day, the nitty gritty, how does that happen? Uh, well, it, it really is based on individual decisions that affect individual behavior. And you know, you, you talked about leadership and setting the tone, but at the end of the day, uh, as Larry Bossidy uh, wrote in his book, Execution, it is about execution. It is about what you do uh, and not, so much about what you say and it's compliance that brings that where the rubber meets the road in terms of the day-to-day -day execution by employees um, and as my british colleagues and i share in this i prefer to say is the colleagues versus employees if we think of all of us ourselves as colleagues it makes it much more collaborative so in that sense the compliance complements the concept of governance in that it helps uh, the organization from the top to the bottom to the newest entry level trainee understand the core principles that drive behavior and what, what is expected in terms of their execution of their responsibilities, and whether they're initial sales trainee or an R&D scientist in a lab or a finance person, an auditor, or HR analyst, whatever it is, uh, they are driven by a core set of principles that govern their behavior at this organization. It's, it's like any other organization, whether it be a team, military organization, 
political one, you name it, uh, all human organizations have to be united uh, for the common purpose, common goals, common values that drive their behavior uh, because they're not just behaving haphazardly, they're there to achieve something. And it's the same. I wonder how much your military experience. Um, yeah, well, you, know, I, you talk about organizations with common goals, and not all organizations do have that, but anyway, it's just a side comment. Well, it's understood. Uh, the, some are more um, laissez faire uh, and by design. And again, uh, not to impose any one particular set uh, of values on, on others. But generally speaking, most organizations, regardless of whether they're um, more, more creative or, or more executional, uh, depend on, for their success on producing something of value to a customer that, that deems it uh, worthy of purchasing and paying something for that. So that can be um, anything uh, along the spectrum of creativity to, to more mundane activities. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, you have to be organized and, and again, uh, make sure people behave within certain parameters to be successful. Um, so in terms of contrasting with governance, you know, governance uh, historically has, again, focused purely on board behavior, purely on shareholder uh, value and made being accountable to shareholders. Uh, and, and again, it's not really entirely different when you look back at American history, where the initial driving interests were of, of landowners uh, value and protecting their interest and the Senate is essentially a product of that interest. Um, uh, where, but what, what is different uh, is that most corporations, I think most people would agree, are, are not democracies. But uh, compliance programs, however, um, do uh, try to ensure that uh, employees are appropriately educated on the do's and don'ts of a company. Um, but hopefully, again, uh, compliance programs have evolved from more of a rule strict legal basis to more of a values based um, organization. In, in my uh, thesis for my LLM at Georgetown uh, Law, uh, one of the things that was fascinating that I researched was the evolution uh, of compliance programs from ethics programs and how historically uh, people have frankly poo-pooed ethics as sort of too squishy and too ephemeral, too, too abstract to really have real meaning within a, a tough, strict business world. Now that's evolved. Uh, and so that swung the pendulum to more of a strict legal rules-based uh, do's and don'ts, which uh, over time people have found, frankly, turn people off. Uh, they're, they're not motivated by, okay, here's the rule, you need to follow it. Uh, but rather, again, as I mentioned earlier on, you need to connect with their hearts and minds to inspire them. Well, here's why we want to do that, because it reflects the kind of people who we are. It re reflects the character that we represent as a member of this organization to our customers. Mm -hmm. um, and that tends to then catch people's attention uh, and say, okay, I, I agree with that. I believe in that. So maybe this does make sense. Um, now, you, you can't sugarcoat it too much because at the end of the day, there it does need to be an accountability aspect to compliance where it, it's sort of meaningless if people are not held accountable. And that's the part that most people fear the most is, is the discipline, the corrective action. If you get out of line, that's why most people um, tend not to be too happy when they hear the compliance officers coming uh, in to, to visit. <laughs> and I've certainly experienced that. But again, the key is to uh, humanize this to put a human face, to make it realistic, make it practical, uh, make it user friendly and make it collaborative so that rather than thinking uh, people have a target on their back from compliance, that compliance has their back to protect them from and keep them out of trouble uh, so that uh, working together, we can accomplish the business goals that the business has. Hmm. Um. You, you just mentioned um, rules-based versus principles-based approaches to compliance, and that's a theme that in our course we'll be talking about next week um, for governance more generally. And you, you have studied international comparative law, and you've worked in several um, non-American companies, and I think you have some clients outside the United States. And you yeah. certainly have extensive experience and exposure to different practices. 
Um, so I'm curious if you see any differences in approaches to compliance across countries and what those patterns are. Next week, for example, we'll be talking about common law versus civil law, legal traditions. You mentioned Anglo governance, that's the common law version, uh, which is more principles based. And then the civil law tradition coming from Napoleonic and Roman law is more yeah. of the rules based. Um, but I wonder if there are any parallels or other patterns you see in compliance, I guess, differences and do you see convergence with globalization? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, and that brings up a, a term that I think is very important and relevant, particularly as uh, the world shrinks and becomes much more interconnected, interdependent through technology. And, and that's the word culture. Uh, culture is, is, is important to A, uh, appreciate and B, to understand and then finally to integrate in, into what you do from a compliance perspective. Uh, Culture runs really deep uh, into who people are and how they identify with themselves um, uh, as individuals, as nations, as families, etc. And you can very quickly offend people if you miss the culture piece. Um, and so uh, what we have seen, and, and we, we all have heard the stories of, of sort of the ugly Americans who are insensitive to culture or, or or may not fully uh, appreciate the different cultures. Where this comes to bear in compliance is, is, uh, is that particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, um, it's unfortunate that uh, things got really taken to an extreme in this whole area of giving gifts. You know, gifts uh, in many parts of the world uh, is meant to be as a, as a symbol of, of gratitude, of friendship, et cetera. Uh, and is, is presented you know, with all of the very best of human intentions. Uh, and yet now we live in a world where gifts are prohibited. Uh, and like, how did we get here? Well, um, you know, again, uh, no one's naive to, to not understand that, you know, gifts can take different forms and, and taken to the extreme uh, or become bribes um, and illegal bribes. Uh, and so that's where, again, uh, we need to understand how, um, you know, different cultures need to be integrated into this overall recognition that we have a tremendous problem with corruption and bribery. And this is why we need to be very careful uh, with gifts uh, and that we need to explain again why we, we generally are to be risk averse, uh, prohibit gifts. Um, and that there are other ways of expressing appreciation and respect to, to, to other folks. Uh, um, the other, uh, place where this comes up historically is in the whole privacy information security area, particularly in Europe, where during World War II, um, families were encouraged to report on one another to various uh, governments. And so there's become a real culture, an aversion to any kind of intrusion on privacy. Um, and you see that manifest itself in the EU with extremely strict um, privacy regulations, much stricter than historically have been true here in the U.S., although that may be changing. Um, so again, understanding that history and that culture, I think, is important when driving uh, certain policies for particularly global companies. And even some of the smallest of companies have global reaches. So um, I, I think, and certainly one of the wonderful aspects of Chicago Booth is its international global uh, reach and, and student population. Um, so, you know, compliance programs, again, to be effective, need to um, take these considerations into account, be able to uh, appropriately address them, and, and again, in a very respectful way, uh, explain uh, why the company can or can't do things. And, and this is where it, they can be tailored to different regions of the world. Um, one of the developments we've really seen uh, that's a bit ironic is that most of the corporate leaders today have sort of grown up, if you will, um, economically, uh, understanding that uh, large centralized uh, organizations tend to be very inefficient. Uh, and that whether it's in, in business or, or in the military, et cetera, you want people on the ground closest to where the conditions are changing to be empowered to make decisions and to have to go up to some centralized headquarters to get permission to do something uh, often um, loses the opportunity because time is of the essence. And so, uh, but that 
technology has changed that dynamic significantly. And so one of the risks of having individualized decision making, as we're seeing, frankly, in the US with the whole COVID-19 is, is inconsistency. You have individualized states and governors making different decisions that, uh, again, on the one hand, may be um, true to the conditions on the ground in their state, but yet is uncoordinated and inconsistent on a broader national level that may affect the larger organization in the country. Similarly, in, 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 organ, in corporations, um, there's now become more of a premium on consistent compliance throughout the world. Uh, and with technology and software, uh, the time delay, the, the, the cost of information transfer, in other words, is removed because it's instantaneous. Um, and so, so now, uh, you have more of a centralized hub kind of uh, organization uh, for compliance versus uh, distinct sort of pockets of compliance that are directed regionally. Okay, so globalization is pushing convergence as yeah. it does in so many other things. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and there's a lot of opportunity for cost savings there too, where um, if you go on a more regional organizational level, um, you tend to replicate organizational structures uh, where you can streamline that significantly by having a centralized hub that's supported by technology um, and certain core elements um, that, that, are, that are shared, but then you identify also specifically where you can uh, customize to that region, taking into account certain local laws and regulations, certain customs, et cetera, where you can tailor the specific policies and procedures uh, to that region or to that country. Yeah. Again, I think very, very important. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, credibility of the compliance program, the trustworthiness of the compliance program and of the individuals articulating the compliance standards, starting with the CEO and president, regional leaders, et cetera. The business leaders, not the lawyers, but the business leaders need to genuinely convey their belief uh, in what they're saying. I've been very fortunate to have worked uh, over the years and here currently with clients where the CEOs are tremendously clear. Um, of course, I help them in the background to be that way, but uh, to, that they articulate a very clear message as to what their expectations are relative to compliance. And again, integrate that into uh, business performance so that they're, they're, the DNA, as I like to say, of, of the commercial DNA and the compliance DNA are intertwined uh, in a way that uh, ensures success in both rounds. It's, it's, they're not mutually exclusive, which is a fear, of course, uh, of some folks that if you're overly compliant or if you're just compliant at all, you, you miss out on business opportunities. That, that certainly does not have to be the case. So I'm gonna ask a cynical question. Hey, I'm an economist, right? Sure. And we're, at, we're at Chicago. Um, but so it, it is not uncommon for global companies to put manufacturing in lower cost countries where costs of complying with, say, pollution regulations are lower. And in some economic sense, that's actually efficient. You know, we could talk about that, but this is not a microeconomics class. Um, but along the same lines, um, it, it, I would imagine that I could see a company offshoring non-compliance on, say, the rigorousness of the rigor with which we manufacture our pharmaceuticals or something like that. Um, what mechanisms in place make that less, less uh, more difficult to do? Or, I'm not sure how I'm formulating the question here, but... No, I, I think I, I understand yeah. <clears throat> what you're getting at is uh, what's to prevent companies from a purely economic basis of taking advantage of lower costs of manufacturing. Yeah, we'll comply with U.S. laws, but, you know, laws are not as strict in wherever and we'll just, we can, you know, your, your family came from Hungary, I believe. So let's manufacture in Hungary, you know. <laughs> well, and, and in fact, um, that is true. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, not to get too technical, but whatever you manufacture, wherever you manufacture, once you bring it into the U.S., it needs to meet U.S. standards. So it's not like you can avoid those standards um, of manufacturing quality. Uh, but to your broader point, just in the more abstract, uh, 
of what incentive, in other words, what's in it for the company to be perhaps higher minded, to be perhaps more ethically driven and not just go for the pure economic play, but rather maybe go um, and perhaps be willing to spend more to, to ensure higher quality or, or higher uh, environmental um, standards, et cetera. Or, you know, in a lot of countries, bakshif is the way things get done in business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the, the, the cynical part of me <laughs> that, um, you know, ever since Adam and Eve, uh, people have been induced to do things that they probably shouldn't do. And they've rationalized doing that. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily bad humans. It means that they're humans. It just means that there's a weakness to temptation. I think that at that very core basic level, if we understand that, then we, we sort of get it as to why do we need laws at all? Why do we need any kind of set of values that drive behavior that, that say, you know, you can do certain things, but you can't do other things? Um, because humans will be humans as long as humans are around. And people will be prone to temptation and to make bad judgments and mistakes. That's true of anyone. And so understanding that means that we're going to have to have some kind of system that helps uh, consistently produce the behavior that's positive or that we deem as positive and to avoid the behavior that we deem as negative or destructive, et cetera. Uh, increasingly, uh, I think on a positive level, um, companies uh, and people and organizations, countries, societies are seeing how um, short-term results can lead to long-term dangers uh, if, if not taken into account. It's going to evolve and some will be better at it than others. Uh, from an economic perspective, uh, I think you certainly you're much better versed at this than, than I am, Mike, but um, the opportunity costs, the externalities that are involved uh, in terms of environment, uh, protecting the environment, of, of, of appealing to customers uh, as a company that is sensitive to racial injustice, for example, something we've been seeing. Uh, many companies making public statements uh, and generally committing dollars and efforts to address that societal concern. In the past, companies would not do that. Um, traditionally, uh, many CEOs and boards would say, you know what, um, that's not for us to articulate. Our job is to do our business and return value to shareholders. Uh, but we're seeing a huge change in that area. And I would suggest it's not purely um, driven by ethics or values. It's driven by business considerations because increasingly consumers want to spend their money with companies that reflect these priorities. These and shareholders. Yeah, the shareholders. But in the end, the shareholders and the consumers, the customers, the markets are still driving behavior. So the core economic principles that we all learn, I think still are holding true. What's changing is uh, uh, society's demands uh, uh, on what it values. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's something that, again, all good leaders, all good companies uh, keep their thumb on the pulse of, of what, what is it that sells? Again, what do people want? The danger here is historically, and I've seen this, is, is this concept of monetizing demand, no matter how bad that demand may be for people. You know, an extreme, you know, uh, addictive drugs um, uh, that, that ruin people's lives. Um, you know, criminals, you know, we've deemed it criminal, um, monetize that demand and sell heroin to people, get them addicted um, and, and make money uh, doing that. Now, um, you know, on a pure economic basis, they're providing a supply to a demand. Uh, they're, they're a life sciences company, sort of. <laughs> well, there's been plenty of folks that have suggested, you know, you know with the whole opioid crisis, not, not a whole lot yeah. different, right? Um, same thing with, with big tobacco, historically, in, in essence. Uh, some might even say in the past, and this is just Steve Incy talking, that maybe orange juice <laughs> may, or even milk, the dairy products that may reflect that kind of Sugar. Um, yeah. demand. Increasingly, we're learning as adults, uh, dairy products uh, may not be good for you. Uh, just talk to Tom Brady, <laughs> you know, uh, um, and other pro athletes. So again, uh, society and science is evolving, uh, and that's driving consumer demand and consumer values which again re reflects the market in terms of what a company should be responsive to. At the end of the day, um, business leaders uh, have a very short period of time to be successful, you know, how success is determined. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly in American companies where 
you know, you live quarter to quarter, year to year, not a very long period of time to really affect meaningful change. Um, and that's where they have to be very careful. And that's another uh, sort of what's in it for me aspect from a compliance perspective. If you're in an industry like life sciences, where you have life and death and large amounts of money uh, being paid from public funds, from federal and state funds, you're under a lot of scrutiny and you have very limited wiggle room to, to make a mistake. That's generally true at any senior executive, but especially in those industries. So it behooves you to make sure that, um, if you excuse the blunt language, you don't screw up from a compliance perspective and otherwise mar uh, your successful business uh, record, that you incorporate that into the DNA so that you don't have some rogue salesperson making a dumb decision out in the field that pulls the whole company down to include you. Um, we've had CEOs, I've seen it, there's a long history of, of CEOs uh, who um, don't take that into account and, and get fired and even prosecuted uh, for those kind of mistakes that are readily avoidable. And that's a key message too. This stuff now, uh, it's not in the early stages in the early 2000s or even 90s when I first got into it where things were just evolving. It, it's really much like the life science industry where the entire DNA and RNA molecule has been split apart and sliced and diced so you can customize and tailor medication to each individual now increasingly. So too, uh, the commercial compliance sort of DNA has been really understood and taken apart and we can really uh, scale it up in a very proportionate way, risk a way. So it's very cost effective and substantively effective in terms of preventing and detecting improper activity, while at the same time, hopefully motivating and inspiring people to do the right thing. Um, you know, one of the things I like to say is compliance is about doing what's right, not just what's required. And, and when you really think about that uh, and you can articulate it and provide the, the, the branding and messaging and marketing around this to, to again integrate into the company in terms of its identity and who it is, it can be quite inspirational um, and, and really create a, a wonderful opportunity to, to enhance the brand that you're building as a CEO for your company. Um, again, some industries are higher risk than others. Um, and I mentioned uh, those. Uh, and, and so, you know, th those yeah. are the industry in particular I would stress to any students out there, any aspiring or current CEOs, or board members, um, um, mid managers who are looking to be successful is don't look at compliance as frankly a pain in the butt, which it can be if done improperly. Look at it as a, as a value adding support structure that if you're smart about it, uh, it can enhance your ability to compete and win, which is after all what you want to do. So um, it's, it's about being a good corporate citizen, again, not in sort of a naive uh, goody two shoes kind of way, but in a real effective, meaningful kind of way that resonates with your employees, resonates with your board, resonates with, with uh, customers and clients out there and the public. Um, and that's always a good recipe for success. This is why I always love talking to you, or actually you're just listening to you speaking about this. You, you, you're so passionate and clear on the importance of the values and, and the ethical dimension, but not in a preachy way. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, and I'm tempted to just end the, the talk here. I know your time is valuable, but there's a question on the left field that has been running in the back of my mind here. Um, Fire away. And that, have you ever done any compliance work in financial services? I know. Short answer is no. I didn't I think not. so. So I want to mention financial services because this is Booth, which, you know, is the center of the academic and professional training of finance world. It really is. We're, we're the world capital of finance. And Absolutely. Um, we're, we're not as finance centric as we traditionally had been 20 years ago, but we still have a strong component of it. And many of, of my students work in financial services in some way. And I've been thinking you work in life sciences, obviously compliance, the downside risks are potentially extremely high, perhaps the worst, um, with lives at risk in testing drugs and selling them and so forth. Um, but another, in, you know, industries with manufacturing, with pollutants, that's a similar issue. But another area where compliance risks seem very high is financial services. And we see scandals after scandal after scandal um, because, um, you know, Financial products are easy to engineer 
and they can blow up easily because of the effects of leverage and so forth and so on. Um, so I was thinking about, you're talking about compliance and developing a culture in which this is something we all, we have shared values, we think this is important. And you were compelling in talking about life sciences. Our, our purpose is to, to help people with their, with their health and their life quality and their, the, you know, the duration of their life and so forth and so on, having a real positive impact on people's lives. That's a common motivating theme. And I think that works really well. I'm not so sure that this is, is so easy to do in life sciences. So, I mean, I'm sorry, in financial services. I want to throw this out mostly for the, my students in those areas to think about. In right. financial services, yes, you are improving people's lives with portfolios or insurance or something like that, but it's not quite the same thing. And another aspect of financial services I think is problematic is that um, a lot of the value comes from a small percent of star employees. Those star employees are easily transportable to another company because they have what I call general human capital in the other course I teach. So to some extent, they are effectively independent agents, even though they're an employee of a Deutsche Bank or a Goldman Sachs or whatever it would be. And trying to get the end motivation is less intrinsically driven and more extrinsically financially driven. It's the nature of the industry, incentive compensation. And it seems to me that the challenges for compliance and building that cultural reinforcement for it may be hardest, harder in financial services than life sciences. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me share some thoughts with you that uh, you're right uh, to point out that um, there are more challenges, uh, I would say, in um, inspiring people, perhaps uh, in a more tangible way. Uh, it, it's, it's more tangible to, to point to a sick patient and their family and yeah. how they, they might be very negatively affected if, if people didn't do the right thing. Um, it is more, uh, it's more than one step removed uh, with financial services. But the, the core common element, though, is still sales and marketing. Yes. Uh, and that's been my focus. So uh, it's, it's about money. Let's, let's be candid as, as people may find that word distasteful, but the reality is it's about making money uh, and, and, and increasing shareholder value. And in a capitalist democratic economy, uh, that, there's nothing wrong with that. So let's be clear about that too. So, so how do you um, make sure that financial service folks um, don't cross lines? And there's been a long, long history of uh, problems uh, with that, uh, insider trading, et cetera, uh, with financial services uh, going awry uh, from a compliance perspective. Um, and again, um, at the end of the day, it has to start at the top. It has to start with the leaders of the organization setting the example uh, and, and articulating precisely uh, what the standards are and then holding people accountable. Um, unfortunately, it, it, the more abstract things get, my experience has been, the more you have to focus on the punishments, on the negative consequences of what can happen to you if you don't comply. And that's never pleasant. It's never something you want to do. But I find that that increasingly is just the truth. Um, and you, you can set out very positive um, motivational uh, incentives um, uh, and tie compensation uh, to performing in an appropriate compliant way and, and tying that. And that's as true also in life sciences, commercial folks as it is in the financial services sector. Um, but at the end of the day, if people cross lines, you, you have to not only hold those individuals accountable, but then uh, communicate that to the rest of the organization and say, here's what can happen to you because this is what happened to him. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 uh, you know, you don't use names and things like that. And, uh, for privacy considerations, but at the same time, you incorporate that into training um, and, and communicate that. You know, uh, again, uh, I, I guess from a historical perspective, more of the Old Testament approach, uh, <laughs> uh, where it's a little bit fire and brimstone. Um, uh, and uh, again, it, it'll have, have to vary by organization, but I'm not sure there's any uh, other answer right now. Uh, but to hopefully, again, the key is, is articulate and is not going overboard, <coughs> excuse me, with incomprehensible rules and regulations that only lawyers can decipher. Trying to keep things simple and clear and meaningful 
and, and keeping it front of mind, not back of mind with a checklist. Um, so again, integrating into the day-to-day -day activity, this is where, again, the difference between governance and compliance is the compliance is day-to-day. -day. It's the nitty-gritty operations that affect people's decisions and their behavior and, and making sure that that behavior is consistent within certain boundaries. Um, governance is a much broader, higher level concept. The end goal is the same, is that the company uh, produce activities within certain boundaries uh, to produce value. Um, it's just uh, the, the focus is different uh, in terms of the individual focus, shareholders, boards versus employees. Um, but again, and the activities are different. So that, that's where they both, again, this goes back to the complementing uh, differentiation. Uh, I think it's a great question and, and I think it's going to be an ongoing problem. Um, I, but I do believe though, um, as much as many people may, may be cynical about the financial services sector in this regard, that um, in my personal experience, you know, um, working with different organizations, I've been very pleased uh, with the character and integrity of certain organizations that I invest in, that I have my retirement funds, 401k funds with, and, and that's why I invest with them. Now, time will tell if, if I'm wrong, but my sense is, is that these organizations are very well run and, and, and um, inspire my trust as an investor with them. Um, again, David Shore has done studies uh, where in ancient Egypt, uh, various traders uh, were successful because of the word of mouth trust that, that was generated through their day-to-day -day behavior where their, their word was their bond. Their, you know, when they made a promise, they kept it. Uh, again, that may sound very simplistic and naive in today's very complex world, but at some level, I think we have to remind ourselves that at the end of the day, that's what drives success. Um, and I think most really successful leaders and individuals will come back to that, is that um, you know, the core fundamental values don't change. Uh, how you apply them and the conditions that you apply them do. And I learned that back in uh, sixth grade, <laughs> where at parochial school, where uh, Mrs. Mrs. Walsh, a tough Irish lady, uh, you know, taught me that. And I've often reflected on that over the years, where she was absolutely right. Uh, again, you have to have to be cognizant of the complexity of the world and and the different conditions where different judgments uh, can be very tough. It's not always an easy decision. But uh, I always fall back on core principles and try to distill, uh, make what seems complex into something much more simple and basic. Uh, and I find that um, we, we make the right decisions that way. And, and I've had basically made a career doing that. Um, uh, and and it, again, it's not just one person. That's another big mistake. It's not just the, the soothsaying compliance officer, but rather it's a corporate team of individuals that are unified in their common goal to make good decisions, the right decisions, to do what's right, not just what's required. There's the Hewlett Packard case where the, the, the company came under a lot of criticism several years ago for wiretapping uh, somebody where technically the, the attorneys deemed it was quote legal, but then when it got released in the public, they came under huge criticism because most people felt that ethically it was not the right thing to do. Um, that's the kind of distinction where you know, responsible boards, uh, enlightened leaders ask that question. And, and, and as, as a professor, you know, the key to learning is, is asking questions. Um, the Socratic method that teases out uh, the ideas uh, from different perspectives is, is, well, wait a second, even though we can do that, do we want to do that? Should we do that? What are the uh, implications? What are the pros and cons? And then you have, uh, you know, a different team of highly educated qualified, experienced people giving different perspectives. And that's where the leader then has to sort through that and decide, okay, here's my decision and here's why. Um, and it's that process, going back to compliance is a process, that, that again, a, a really well-structured, meaningful, thoughtful compliance program that integrates all of the things that we've talked about over the past hour or so, uh, helps a leader make the right decisions. It helps employees make the right decisions day to day and, and is, provides the resource to do that. Okay. So I, I don't know if that, that answered your question. It probably set up another 
session down the road to focus on financial services. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Or maybe that's a new line of business for you. It, that's <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, wow, this, is, this has been really wonderful. Lots of food for thought. I've learned a lot. Um, I really appreciate it. Steve, it's, always, it's a real honor to have you speaking to the class. I want to thank you very much. Well, again, my, my pleasure, Mike. Uh, again, a real honor and privilege uh, to be your student, to be an alumnus of the great University of Chicago Booth School of Business, uh, uh, and to be, most importantly, your friend, uh, a man that I respect uh, tremendously. Uh, I really value our, our relationship over the years. It, it's scary to think how many years it's been now, but... Likewise. It's been about 15 years. <laughs> yeah, it has. And... Uh, again, I always learn from you, uh, uh, and um, it's a wonderful experience. I think that's what makes Chicago great. Uh, you know, I've, I've attended uh, several different schools, all you know, great schools in their own right. But uh, as I've shared, I think before, and if I haven't, now let me say it here on the record: Chicago is my favorite. Um, it, I'm the, it's because of the sort of cauldron. Uh, of ideas and the classroom experience. I know we're here virtual, but uh, it's the ability to challenge one another respectfully, but again, aggressively, um, and to, to not take anything for granted and to question. And, and then it's through that process that hopefully uh, all students then take with them and integrate into their professional lives that really makes for a better world, uh, you know, a better professional a career, better professional organization that you're a part of. So I'm, I'll always be forever grateful and a very, very proud alumnus of the University of Chicago. Well, I feel the same way about having you as a student and a friend. Thank you, oh. Steve. Thank you. My pleasure, Mike. You have a great rest of the day and a great uh, course uh, with your students. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>